Hey everyone, I'm Matt and welcome to The Good Trouble Show. Today we have an exclusive interview with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, speaking exclusively about UAP, otherwise known as UFOs. This is, as far as we know, is the first time a current United States Senator has sat down to solely talk about this critical topic. But first, do us a solid, hit that thumbs up and subscribe button. We are also on all podcasting platforms. Just search for The Good Trouble Show with Matt Ford. Finally, finally, uh, maybe the most important part, your financial support enables us to bring, bring you this show with exceptional guests. You can become a Patreon supporter for the price of a Starbucks coffee. Just go to www.patreon.com forward slash The Good Trouble Show and choose the plan that is right for you. Also on YouTube, Super Chats are open and are a great way to show us your love. We, uh, we very much appreciate it. So with that out of the way, let's get right to it. Today, we have two exceptional guests to bring us up to date on this whole UAP thing uh, and to break down the hearing, or sorry, not the hearing, the interview that we recorded with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand last Thursday. So please welcome on the, uh, in the middle screen there, journalist uh, Christopher Sharp of the Liberation Times and on the right, Vinny Adams of Disclosure Team. Guys, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank yeah, you so oh, much. There we go. Having <laughs> All right, just making <laughs> making sure we're uh, making sure we're good there. Oops, sorry. Uh, anyway, yeah, no, thanks for joining us. So, uh, yeah, we're we're very very excited about this. So, uh, you know, we've we've been in contact with Senator Gillibrand's office for a very long time, and um, this this interview has literally been months in the works, uh, and we're very very uh, very very excited about it. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned often, a lot of our viewers are, uh, they don't really track this whole UAP, UFO topic uh, very much. We primarily uh, have political guests and uh, message and things like that on, on, on that front. So the UAP thing is new to some folks. So with that in mind, Vinny, if you don't mind, bring us up to date or sort of give us a short historical timeline of how all of this really began, in my view, which was the New York Times 2017 article, and kind of walk us through from that point uh, up until today. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but yeah, you mentioned it right there. The uh, December 16th, I think, was the release of the New York Times article, which was titled Glowing Auras and Black Money, the Pentagon's Mysterious UFO Program, which really laid out the work that had been done from 2007 to 2012, this five year period where the um, the UFO subject was studied within the Pentagon, headed by Lou Elizondo. Now, we know that since then, there's a lot of um, points come up about the, the consistency of the dates, the program, its relationship to, to ORSAP, but I won't go too deep into, into those issues right now. But this was really what kickstarted things off in, in the last few years with regards to uh, the coverage of the UFO subject, especially in the mainstream media and, and going forward now. Following the article, we had the release of the three Navy videos, which uh, came out of the Pentagon and were officially acknowledged as as real and genuine videos. Then uh, I suppose the next important um, point was the National Defense Authorization Act, and I believe that was for fiscal year 2021. And this was where we were given the, uh, the, the 180 days for them to produce a public report on the, the UFO subject or UAP, um, which we got in June of 2021. And then consistently over the last few years since then, in each uh, National Defense Authorization Act, there has been language pertaining to UAP and legislation. And it just keeps getting uh, deeper and bigger each year. And here we are in you know, in this year, and it's, you know, this is why we're, we're here to talk about the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office and uh, and how that's been run, you know, since it sort of started about nine, ten months ago. So, yeah, it's it's like a, it's kind of been a progression in, in the last five years. Yeah, it, it, it definitely has. And uh, Senator Gillibrand, along with uh, some other senators, but I, I feel like she's really led the fight on this whole, on this uh, topic in particular, uh, we really owe her a, a debt of thanks and the people that have been supporting her on both sides of the aisle. And I, you know, I always like to emphasize that. I'm, I'm uh, a registered Democrat, I'm a liberal, but, uh, but people on the Republican side are doing a lot of great work on this as well. And this topic in particular, 
is really transcends any sort of party. So while we're championing the efforts and what Senator Gillibrand and her staff have done, there are people on the other side of the aisle that are equally as supportive in, in doing a lot of great work on this. So, uh, so speaking of uh, Senator uh, Gillibrand, I want to play a clip. This was this was uh, I think about a month ago uh, with uh, with the senator during the intelligence intelligence committee committee hearing with the uh, uh, director of uh, the office of uh, ODNI director Avril Haines. Uh, let's watch this, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Haynes, in last year's Intelligence Authorization Act, Senators Rubio, Warner, Heinrich, Burr, Blunt, and I created uh, the Arrow, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, uh, to break down the stovepipes between the intelligence community and the military regarding unidentified aerial, marine, and other phenomenon, which could pose a risk to the safety of our service members, as well as collection risks against sensitive facilities and overseas military bases. As re Oops, sorry. <laughs> it's the wrong thing. We'll just listen. Yeah, so that, that was, uh, sorry, I cut away on the video a little bit too soon, but that was uh, ODNI Director, uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines. So, so Christopher, she's, Senator Gillibrand and really all of the, the, the people in, the, the, uh, the, in Congress that have supported this Arrow office, they've really had a bit of an uphill battle getting the support from the intelligence com community and the Pentagon, correct? Yes, and the battle has not been run won yet. In fact, I get the impression, as backed up by the letter um, which came out on Saturday, uh, but was from, well, was from the 27th of April from Mark Warner and um, Senator Senator Rubio, so the chair and vice chair of the intelligence um, committee, and yeah, they they voiced their frustrations. Um, so it's still an uphill battle for uh, senators within both predominantly the um, the intelligence committees and the armed services committees that have really, really led the charge on getting this language up and running. And um, yeah, and still, despite the National Defense Authorization Act and the language contained within that for the arrow, uh, the law still has not been implemented yet. So, for instance, um, uh, th 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 there's no deputy um, director of the Arrow, and um, also the communication isn't great as well. That there's no there's no more activity on 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 Twitter, for instance, since that le first tweet that it led off last summer, and. Um, there's no there's no secure public facing website as well so that whistleblowers can come forward so it is really really still an uphill battle for for all senators involved pushing this and those representatives as well um such as Burchett, Carson, Gallego who have all been really really pushing this forwards as well yes so speaking of of the lack of support. One of the one of the initial issues was a lack of funding. So uh, I want to play this clip with Senator Gillibrand and uh, get your thoughts. And is the Arrow Office fully funded in your budget? Yes, I believe it is. Uh, Can you make sure because it was left off last year so from both the DoD and Intel's budgets. So right. So it's in DoD, but I think our support is funded in the National Intelligence Program. And I'll we'll check to make sure. So on the everybody DoD. else can answer the question. I, I believe it is funded. Thank you. Yes. I support center. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's just crazy that they would mandate the creation of this office. They have all of this language in, and, and I think, Vinny, you had said that this was this what went back to, uh, what was the year, 20, when was Arrow established? Was it 22 or, or uh, 
When, when was that? Yeah, I, I don't remember. It was established in the summer of 2022. Or well, that's certainly when uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick became the head uh, of Arrow. It may have been a month or two before he was officially announced as the director. I'm not too clear on, you know, the, the start date compared to when they actually announced his, uh, you know, directorship. Because I think, well, and I think, Chris, you had, you had touched on this. They, they had to send a letter uh, Senator, uh, Senator Gillibrand, and I believe it was uh, 13 or 14 other senators, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher, that, that said, hey, where's the money? We have this office and the uh, OUSDI, or Office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, they weren't apparently saying that they didn't have any money. So it sort of felt like no one knew that they didn't have money, which is just really strange. Chris, what have, what have you heard on, on that? It seems to me that it just isn't a priority at the moment for the likes of um, Ronald Moultrie, Lloyd Austin, um, and others within the DOD and also within the intelligence community as well. I mean, look at a few weeks ago, for instance, in the Armed Services Committee, Subcommittee for Emerging Threats and Capabilities, when Gillibrand asked Michael J. McCord, the Undersecretary of Defense um, controller, um, saying, I was disappointed that for the second year in a row, the Arrow was not fully funded in the department's budget request, understanding that we cannot get into specific budget figures in this forum. Can you discuss why Arrow was not fully funded? And in his response, Michael J. McCord uh, seems to suggest that, um, that Ronald Moultrie had not relayed any concerns or requests for fund for further funding to to him. So, I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's he's really re-engaged really with the process. And I would argue it's been like that from the start since AIMSG was first put together. I mean, we had a similar situation around about this time last year when the law still hadn't been fully implemented. And um, I mean, we thought all the troubles had gone away because from an operational um, perspective, the ARRI was supposed to be reporting directly to the um, Deputy Secretary of the Defense and also um, I think it was Stacey Haynes as well, I think is the principal um, deputy for um, ODNI as well. I may have got that wrong, sorry. Um, so she was... So um, the ARRI was supposed to report to those two, basically. But still, because it's not been implemented, um, Kirkpatrick, the director of the ARRI, is still reporting to Ronald Moultrie like he was last year. So we're really, the status quo still has not changed. And you can see why the Congress is really, really growing frustrated of all of this. Yeah, it, it's... It all seems, and from what I've observed, seems to land at the feet of uh, Ronald Moultrie. And, and as Lou Elizondo, who was the uh, director of uh, the Pentagon's previous program, ATIP, to study this particular uh, issue of, of UAP, as he noted, all of the obfuscation and um, all of that sort of stuff started with, or, or really the source seems to be, the Office of Undersecretary of Defense, uh, uh, OUSDINS, which is under Moultrie. So, um, and you know, I have some thoughts about that. Anyway, so uh, so let's uh, let's get to the interview. So, as I mentioned, this interview was a year uh, in the making, and uh, this is the first time a sitting United States senator sat down for an interview to uh, speak about the topic. So, we're going to roll the interview, and afterwards we'll break it down. So, everyone, uh, here we go. Our next guest is a trailblazer in bringing the UAP subject out from the shadows. In 2023, she led a bipartisan effort to place 33 pages of legislation on UAP in the National Defense Authorization Act that is now law. Please welcome from the great state of New York, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Senator, how are you? 
Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being here. And and we know your schedule is tight, so we're going to jump right into the uh, to the subject of hand. Great. So, Senator, there have been reports of objects in our skies and undersea from our military pilots and other service members that they just they couldn't explain. Now, these objects are referred to as unidentified anomalous and undersea phenomenon, or UAP. So, Senator, what was your turning point when you decided that that we as a nation, you know, that we have to take these reports seriously and look into them? Well, it was a combination of things. Uh, the thing that really got me highly concerned was when service members had come forward with digital evidence, whether it was video or radar or different sensory uh, data, that they were retaliated against or disregarded or somehow diminished or demeaned in their roles. And I thought as chair of personnel at the time, the personnel subcommittee of the uh, Armed Services Committee, I was not going to tolerate our service members uh, being in any way disparaged because they were doing their jobs to report these um, sightings. And so once I heard about that, I started getting much more um, detailed in my review of what is this, what is the you know, the the scope of these unidentified air phenomenon. Um, what is the military's role? Are they reviewing them? Do they actually analyze them? Do they identify them? And unfortunately, I found out the answer was largely no, and they weren't actually doing the work, <clears throat> which is why me and a few other senators on the Armed Services and Intelligence Committee decided to create a specialized office two years ago within the Department of Defense that were supposed to review all sightings and to make sure that whistleblowers can come forward, to make sure that no one can be retaliated against and that they, that people are obligated to report because we wanted to make it clear that, that the military could not um, disparage or retaliate against people who were just giving evidence of things they've seen, which is absolutely essential from a domain awareness, national security perspective. So we are now just pushing the, the military and the intelligence community to fund this office and to do the work. Now, and we're going to talk about the whistleblowers a little bit more in, in depth here in a bit. But w one thing I wanted to touch on, so these military uh, servicemen and women that have testified observing UAP operating in a way that exceed our current understanding of physics. And a lot of these cases, they go all the way back to World War II and beyond. So with that in mind, would, would this preclude adversarial operations such as those from China and Russia from the equation? No. And in fact, for a lot of people, that's what it's all about. Um, what the goal of the office is to do is review all data related to unidentified aerial phenomenon present past and as reported. We also now have the goal of increasing our collection. So actually increasing the sensors and the radar capabilities and the ability to glean information and data from airspace that previously we really didn't monitor. Uh, we do very little monitoring of airspace outside of commercial airspace. Uh, and we have requirements for commercial airspace. You have to have emitters, you have to have lights. But many of these sightings can be uh, in the areas that we don't monitor very effectively. And so the new ambition for this office is to make recommendations about additional sensors, what we need developed. Um, and also it's important from just plain old national security. If you've got China developing hypersonic missiles, you need the ability to detect those as well as a Chinese spy balloon or Chinese drones or Iranian drones or any other adversaries military capability or spying capability that's being utilized uh, over our, our military bases, over our missile sites, over our assets. Um, it's vital that we have that domain awareness and that we can ultimately have superiority, air superiority in places of conflict. Now, uh, going back to, to Arrow, so when, when you mandated that the Pentagon establish uh, this office that eventually became Arrow, wh what was the reaction from the Pentagon? Did they attempt to interfere or take, care, take control of the narrative? How, how did they react to, to this legislation that you passed or that passed? So I'm not sure. I mean, we, we know what was publicly available. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, you know, when we were recommending this office, they quickly set up their own office, which was a bit a bit odd. 
Um, right. But I don't know why that might have been in the works. Who knows? Sure. Um, but our goal was to really create something transparent and accountable to the American public that has a, a, a public facing um, aspect that has public reports and that destigmatizes the mm -hmm. sightings of aerial phenomenon. Uh, it is imperative that we destigmatize this because we need facts and we cannot allow things like spy balloons to just coast over the United States, right. taking photos and right. getting data from our missile sites and our bases. It's, it's unacceptable. And, you know, in many respects, we were asleep at the switch because we weren't looking for this stuff because from the military's perspective, it didn't exhibit hostile behavior. It wasn't attacking, it wasn't shooting, it wasn't chasing, and it wasn't um, evading. All of those types of behavior are things they would have cared about and would have really tried to not only understand but um, defend against. But because the behavior of a lot of this aerial phenomenon that we've captured is by chance, like the mm. fact that some device goes under an existing um, craft that's recording data and information is really how we're catching these. It's when our pilots fly by something and say, what is that? What is that object? What is that? What is that aircraft? What, what is that doing? And, and right. why is it moving in that way? And that's hard to understand. Our devices and sensors on our aircraft aren't calibered to capture this information and easily reposit it to a scientific group to review it. So we're going to try to change our sensors on aircraft to do that so we could actually capture the data, review the data, and be able to assess it one way or the other, known, unknown, and if known, what is it? Um, we've been able to assess, you know, let's see, our January report, we assessed 366 um, pieces of data from sightings since the last 20 years. We've had a huge influx in reporting, and now we're up to 700, I think, is what they wow. said in the hearing. Okay. 700 or 600? 650. So yeah, 650 okay. unknown aerial phenomenon. And so of the 650, uh, we know that in the first batch, the 366, they designated about 150 were orbs or balloon-like objects. About two dozen were drones, a handful were debris or birds, uh, but 171 in the first tranche were unknown still. And so in this larger tranche of another 300 or so, we'll assess um, what they are. And th th this this office in review isn't, isn't ideal for UFO enthusiasts in that they aren't necessarily getting to the bottom of past sightings. Like, is it right. real? Was it, is it true? Did that happen? Um, because all they can do is review data that they have access to. And <clears throat> all you have is a video clip or all you have is a photo. You don't have any additional data to weigh that against to assess what actually is it. So a lot of the goal of this office is to get <clears throat> much more data so we have the tools we need to assess what is it uh, in real time as opposed to having to go back historically. So we may never know of the, let's say the top 10 sightings historically that enthusiasts are certain are, you know, a flying saucer or whatever it is. You may never actually be able to assess that and say yes or no, because you have no additional data. And so what's so important about Aero is it's not only gathering the data that the Air Force and the Navy and other armed services detection has, which is high quality data, mm -hmm. and then comparing that with publicly available data, things like what did the FAA record on that date, time and space? Did anyone have any weather balloons in the area? Did anyone have any other detection devices to see if they got any photographs or any video evidence? All of that is so much more scientific and capable of assessing. And so if you saw the hearing, um, Dr. Kirkpatrick gave us two examples and they both looked, you know, bizarre, but one, he was able to cross-reference enough data and information from public information like FAA, and they could actually identify ultimately that it was, you know, a puddle jumper. It was a, it was a slower flying aircraft that because of the lens and the camera that was able to get the digital images, it was too blurred and too undefined to know what it was. But with cross data, they identified it was an aircraft. The second one they showed us was just an orb that came right in a camera's view that traveled seemingly very fast.
um, over some kind of military site and they don't know what it is. And so they might not get any more data to clarify, you know, is it a drone? Is it a balloon? Is it a aircraft? Is it unknown? And so that's the, the hard part, but also the good part. Right. So <clears throat> we won't necessarily know all the past secrets, but my intention is to make sure we know all the future secrets before they become secret, because the whole point is to do the scientific analysis to identify what it is, because if it is Russian or Chinese or Iranian, we must know, and we need to know what technology they've developed and whether they're investing in drone technology or balloon technology or spy technology that we've never seen nor heard of. Got it. Yeah. So, and I think that's fantastic that we're finally, you know, taking this seriously. Let's let's jump back, uh, if you don't mind, for a second uh, to the whistleblower. So, as many people may not be aware, you spearheaded. I think it was like 33 pages of legislation on UAP in the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, and I think one of the most important provisions that that is in there that you guys put in there was was uh, this provision that protects whistleblowers against reprisals and retaliation. Now, sources have claimed to us that they still fear retaliation. Do these claims surprise you at all? No, and um, our office is here to assure them they cannot be retaliated against by law. And if they still fear retaliation, they should reach out to my office because we can make sure that they get interviewed by Dr. Kirkpatrick. We can make sure that they can submit any of their data or information in a confidential way. Um, we can do everything possible to make sure that they can be heard and protected at the same time. Um, you may not know this about my history, but we've been working on military sexual violence for a long time. Right. And we were able to help a lot of service members who wanted to tell their story, but were still afraid of retaliation. And we were able to make sure they got lawyers, that they had um, a confidential way of reporting. And we made sure that they were able to do with what their, with their testimony that what they wanted to, uh, whether it was ever public or not public based on their needs. So we're here to help and um, we're here to make it easier. We are gonna have a public facing uh, website soon. Um, a draft has already been submitted to the higher ups to, to approve. So as soon as that's approved and I asked all the higher ups, when are you gonna approve this? And um, clearly there's a bottleneck somewhere, but I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. And so eventually there'll be a place where anyone can upload data, information, video, photographs, um, and can also see the stuff that's been declassified, which is important so that people can see like, this is how we took this video and this is how we know where it was. And this is the publicly available information we laid on top of it. And that's why we know what it is. That's important so people can know it may look like something on first blush, but with scientific rigor, it's not that. Or it may look like something and we still don't know what it is. So right. the truth is we will get to whatever facts we can, but there'll still be things unknown. Yeah, some of the feedback that we've received in, in particular from um, whistleblowers that have worked on alleged legacy UAP pro, uh, programs, but they're hesitant to come forward is, is what they've shared is that there's no published uh, legal protection mechanisms uh, that are uh, give them the legal assurance that, that they are indeed going to be covered. So they can reach out to your office and yeah. uh, and and you can download or, or, or make it clear exactly what what protections are in place. Yep, they can definitely do that, and they can. Um, we have an email that is confidential, just casework at gillibrand.senate.gov, and if they just put UAP in the ray line, it'll get to our our military staff, who will then follow up and make sure that they are um, given confidential. Uh, support and advice on what what their next steps could be and, and where the protections lie. Excellent. Okay, great. So uh, if you have time, we just have a, a, another couple of uh, really quick questions. Um, so so what would you say to the elected uh, or the unelected gatekeepers in government who do not want to level with the American public about UAP? So my concern is that's not their judge. That's not their job. Um, this type of work should be public. We should have uh, transparency and accountability. There's going to be some stuff that we find that we won't want to share publicly. Like, for example, if we assess that the Chinese have this one kind of drone technology that's a huge national security risk, 
the Department of Defense may decide something like that needs to stay on a secret level so they can not only prepare against it, but they probably don't want China to know that we know what they're doing. So something like that, I could imagine we would try to, to stay um, non-public, but anything that's not related to national security, we should definitely be declassifying. I completely agree with that. So, so finally, should there be legal amnesty for past or present government employees or contractors who have been involved in keeping this from Congress and the American public, sort of as an incentive to, for these people to come forward? That's what the whistleblower language in the 23 NDAA is supposed to protect. But if that language isn't sufficient, these people just have to tell us what part's not sufficient and what they would need in the defense um, whistleblower pr protection to cover them. We're happy to amend the bill this year. I mean, the goal is to give 100% amnesty and whistleblower protection in this space of unidentified aerial phenomenon. Um, and, you know, there, there may be explanations about what programs people were working on. They might have thought it was about something, but it really wasn't, and they were never told what it was about. Mm -hmm. So there, there can be those kinds of misunderstandings. But the truth is, we have the ability to take classified information. We have the ability to talk in classified settings so that they're not breaking their classification uh, NDAs. Um, we have the ability to do that. And so we will write the whistleblower protection to make sure it covers um, compartmentalized uh, programs, special right. uh, access programs and um, intelligence oriented or top secret programs. We can make sure that there's a setting, a, a SCIF or a, a mm -hmm. top secret setting where they can give their testimony. We, we, we will not allow them to be harmed. Fantastic. And we'll we, send will do, we will do whatever is consistent with whatever agreements they made. Excellent. Okay. Well, well, this is great news. And Senator Gillibrand, I mean, we really appreciate uh, you coming on our show to talk about this really important topic. And we know our audience really appreciate your leadership uh, on this. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk on your show. All right. There you go. So, um, so a few thoughts. I, one thing I think folks need to keep in mind is any, any Senator, um, they're going to really be careful to stay in their lane. So we we asked questions that we felt that she would be uh, be in a position to answer and 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 not filter, just so we could get as 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 much information as possible. And and the other thing too with these folks, and you see this also with with Senator Marco Rubio, you have to read between the lines. Uh, with with what they're saying, they're not going to come right out and say there's a non-human intelligence or uh, you know, we've got a, a saucer stashed in the garage somewhere. You, you have to, you have to read the sort of uh, subtext. So you know, when they're when they're talking about um, unknowns or uh, or even just orbs, you know, orbs aren't just going to you know fly around like a like a balloon. It, you have to really um, you have to really listen, but listen to what they're saying very carefully. And my prediction, as this thing continues to roll out, their um, sort of calculated nature and what all of these politicians say when it comes to this subject, that's going to relax as more and more information comes forward. So, um, so yeah. So let, let's uh, let's jump into this interview and just sort of break down some of the questions. So, uh, you know, we asked what was her sort of turning point, and uh, Jill Brand noticed, you know, for her that it was service members coming to her with uh, digital evidence, uh, video, radar, or different sens sensory data, and that these folks were retaliated against. And, and uh, they were either retaliated against, disregarded, or somehow diminished or demeaned in their roles, and that you know, she wasn't going to tolerate it. And she found that, no surprise, that the military wasn't really doing anything about this, other than sort of propagating, in my view, the, the, the stigma. So, uh, Vinny, the, the DOD, they really have had a very well-documented history of obfuscation and um, you know, retaliation against a lot of these folks, correct? Absolutely. We know it's been ongoing for decades. But one thing I will say just before we kind of get into that is that, you know, kudos to you because what you've been doing is actually cultivating a relationship with Senator Gillibrand. And, you know, we all could think of a million questions that we'd love to put in front of her when it, uh, you know, when it comes to UFOs, non-human intelligence. But you can't just throw that at a senator. 
it's not you know it's not the thing to do it's not just a, an, another ufo enthusiast that we're just having conversations back and forth we have to be very careful about the way we approach this and i think after that interview you know it's likely that we'll be able to continue this relationship and maybe you know get to those more important questions further down the line so you know i know some people might be discouraged by the fact that we didn't say what do you know about non-human intelligence and things like that so i i ask people to bear in mind that we're talking with a, a sitting senator here so it's not just a case of throwing everything at her and, and see what she's got to say but yeah as far as the obfuscation and, and the cover-up we all know it's you know been going on for so many years and there is data somewhere you know on in classified programs and you know this is you know there were a couple of comments that the uh, senator gillibrand mentioned in there about you know we may not get to the or to know all the past secrets but we we might get to know all the future secrets before they become secret. This is the kind of positive kind of discussion that we want to hear from, from people in power. So, you know, I do take some positives away from it. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, it, and we definitely looked at it fr uh, from that perspective. Uh, f first off, we're an unknown en entity. We're not CNN or, or anything like that. So just the fact that we were able to get a sitting United States senator to come on and speak about this subject was a, a huge get for us. And the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is you know she sits on the Senate Armed Services Committee. She set, uh, sits on the uh, uh, Senate uh, Select uh, Committee for Intelligence, I think is what it's called. You know, so she is specifically dealing with classified information, and um, you know she, she's got to be careful in what she you know what she can say. I I do think that she's pushing the envelope, and um, and and. We should be very grateful for really going to the mat on this particular subject. It was it was time someone did, and the senator was the right person to do this at the right time. Uh, so uh, let's see where I lost my place here. Um, yeah. So so Chris. So you know we asked about observing UAP exceeding our known physics going back to World War II, and part of that uh, question was. Some people obviously there are incidents where there are balloons or or drones or or things that are misidentified as something um, anomalous when when they actually aren't. But one of the things that that people like Lou Elizondo and others have brought up is the things that appear to have a non prosaic answer, the the behavior of these craft and whatnot. This these sort of vehicles have been observed going all the way back to World War II and probably beyond, where um, you know, where this was before jet propulsion or anything like that. So that was part. That was really what I was uh, asking about. And you know, and she said no. And was curious. What was your, Chris? What was your uh, sort of feeling on her her response to that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, firstly, I would say to people who are expecting, you know, saying, "Oh, there should be tougher questions and stuff like that." You know, get with the real world. You know, this isn't a movie. This is the real world dealing with an actual U.S. senator here, um, and you know, it ta it's taken a lot of time to actually um, arrange this interview. And you know, no matter what questions you ask, um, she's always going to stick with her message. Whatever she wants to say, she's going to say it. And you know, if you'd ask questions like where are the bodies and stuff like that, she's <laughs> right. gonna walk out. Just going to walk out the interview. I mean, right. get real people. I don't know what world these people are living in, but we're dealing with politics here, you know, and uh, the real world, not a movie. Um, to that point, um, in terms of precluding Chinese technology and Russian technology, look, um, I would have to disagree with the senator there. I mean, um, our good friend Graham Rendell, for instance, has catalogued so many incidents going back to the 1940s. And I mean, um, you know, great researchers will, you know, know of events that happened even before that. And, you know, when we're talking about the 50s and 60s, China was in a famine situation. Um, you know, they couldn't even afford horse and carts, let alone fighter jets and, you know, any other advanced military equipment. So um, I, I think, yeah, I think it definitely does preclude this from being China and, and Russia. Um, so. I, I think that, look, this is a really, really good first step here. She said some really good things. And I think, I mean, I, I would compare it to this. Look at the first series of, um, you, you know, on the History Channel with um, Lou Elizondo, of unidentified Lou Elizondo, Chris Madden. They, they would have never mentioned E.T. 
or anything exotic like that. It was a process. And I think we're going to see the same with the politicians as well in terms of that. You know, just think of the enormous progress we've made. Like a year ago, we couldn't have even thought about a sitting senator such as Kirsten Gillibrand appearing on a show like this. And I've said this before on my Twitter, you know, just look how people are positioning themselves. Look how the positions are shifting. Look at um, look at General Olson from the Space Force the other day, for instance, saying that UAP are basically ubi- ubiquitous um, and saying that we need international cooperation and stuff. The Space Force would have never said that a year ago. Kirsten Gillibrand would have never appeared on your show a year ago. So I think positions are shifting on this. And um, like I've said before, I think some major revelations are coming down the line and people preparing for that. I completely agree. And, and again, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you both for the, for the kind, uh, kind, kind thoughts. I, 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 mentioned, uh, I mentioned at the top of this, I said probably going to be 50% are going to love this interview. And then the other 50% will be, why didn't you ask this? Why didn't you ask that? Uh, and I, I certainly understand that frustration. I would have liked to have had, asked some more pressing questions, but again, we were being very careful in, um, in uh, putting forth questions that we knew she would be able to address. Uh, so it wouldn't be a lot of uh, no comment, no comment, no comment. We, we want, wanted to get as much information out of her as, as possible. Now, when we asked about, uh, about Arrow, and we asked, you know, when she mandated it, what was the reaction from the Pentagon? <laughs> she seemed a bit uh, tickled about that. Uh, about that. Uh, you know, she noticed, noticed, or noted sorry, that the Pentagon quickly set up their own office. And with Arrow, she wanted to create uh, something transparent and accountable that has a public-facing aspect, cr- uh, creating uh, public uh, reports, and that would destigmatize UAP uh, topic. She also noted that that with the Chinese balloon situation, that we were completely asleep uh, at the uh, switch, which seemed to certainly be the case. Uh, and, uh, and and she said that you know that our our sensors are not calibrated to catch some of these things. Now, out of that. Out of the, her her reply to this particular answer, I, what I thought was interesting were some of the statistics that she pointed out. Uh, she stated that 300, and uh, this was under Arrow, 366 cases were studied over a 20-year period, which that that I wasn't aware of that it was going that far back. She said 150 were orbs or balloons, uh, about two dozen were were drones. And since, uh, since, since this particular, since they started looking into it, they've had 650 more cases, 171 uh, are still unknown. Vinny, my, my question to you is, you know, obviously balloons and things, drones, whatnot, that's all explainable. But her using the term orb, um, I think that's pretty significant. Orb... When I think of orb, I don't think of anything prosaic in terms of a balloon, a, a drone, a swamp gas, a seagull, whatever. Orb, I feel, is a pretty specific thing. And for 150 of them to be orbs or balloon-like objects, I think that was a pretty significant uh, admission she, she uh, said there. Vinny, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. I mean, she kind of almost brushed over it like it was nothing. It was like, yeah, 150 from the first tranche of uh, reports were orbs and balloon-like objects. Well, orbs, yeah, it's it's that's pretty substantial. And balloon-like objects, you know, what does that actually mean? Well, we do know from the report that we had in January of this year that when they were putting things into categories and, you know, uh, balloon-like entities was used, that they also clarified in that report that just because they had categorized some of these cases, it doesn't mean that they had confirmed or gotten to the bottom of what they were. So, you know, these objects that are still in this 150 uh, bracket could still relate to something anomalous. They're just trying to categorize them, even though there is still the unknown bin on top of that. So, yeah, I was very surprised that, that one, she mentioned orbs, and two, that it was kind of just brushed over slightly. Yeah, I, I, and this kind of goes back to the what I was saying earlier, that you really have to read between the lines with uh, what what politicians and, and officials are are saying. They're, they're very careful in their wording, and it's for a reason. Uh, so, so moving on from that, um, so Chris, let's talk about the Whistleblower Protection and the National Defense Authorization Act. Why was that put in place? And I believe that was one of the first two clauses in the NDAA, correct? 
uh, that's correct. It's, I would have to look through the NDAA myself just to make sure, but it was certainly in there. And it refers to, um, my understanding, it refers to re retrievals um, and back engineering and stuff like that. And look, we're not reverse engineering, we're not talking about reverse engineering um, drones from Russia that are being used currently in Ukraine. We're, we're not talking about this. Uh, we're, we're talking about reverse engineering of um, of potential um, uh, non-human intelligence. That that is literally what we're talking about. So when you guys are having a discussion, you know about whistleblowers, this is literally what we're referring to. It's already come out. People like Hal Putoff have come out, for instance, saying that they've actually come forward and spoken to Kirkpatrick. Others have as well, and I wouldn't be surprised if there were some very very high-ranking people who have spoken to the Congress, but haven't spoken to uh, Kirkpatrick in the Arrow yet. And it's very, very shocking to me that because the law hasn't been implemented, that she is actually going up to you and saying they should contact my office. I mean, this is literally hit why the Arrow exists, so they could deal with this stuff. But I mean, I'll give Kirkpatrick the benefit of the doubt because they don't have a, a big budget. They have a lack of funding. They have a lack of resource. You know, perhaps she's saying, look, we realize that Kirkpatrick, we're going to help you out because look, the, the, the Congress and senators in particular actually have the powers. They have subpoena power. They can do investigations. So they actually probably could argue that they have more power than Kirkpatrick to actually investigate these whistleblower claims about such uh, special access programs that have not properly been reported and clearly reported to the Congress like they should be. Um, so I, I, I think that's 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 a major thing that that you are actually hearing here. So um, yeah, bravo. Yeah, I, I I would agree. And 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 moving forward to the to the next question that we asked, you know, we we mentioned to Senator Senator Gillibrand that sources have reached out to us uh, and and told us that they they still fear retaliation, regardless of the fact that this legislation is in place. And I asked her uh, whether it surprised her that these whistleblowers were still fearful, and uh, and she said no. And as you just mentioned, Chris. She said uh, f f that folks need to directly contact her office, which is very, very significant. Vinny, what, uh, what was your uh, thought? Or what was, sorry, a bit tongue-tied today. What, what were your thoughts on, uh, on her response to that? I mean, I'm not really surprised. And I think it's important as well that whistleblowers are going to be cautious about coming forward, you know? It's a big deal. And how can they really be given the... Uh, clarification that there's not going to be further down the line some kind of repercussions and you know it's great that senator gillibrand is willing to offer the you know direct direct access to her office i was very surprised that she released the email address publicly here because i just know what some people are like <laughs> and they're just going to be bombarding her with oh, yeah. all sorts of uh, you know this and that but right you know, it just shows the transparency that she's talked about and the fact that she said that whistleblowers can also let them know or let her know what amendments need to be added for the Defense Authorization Act going into the next year for 2024. So, you know, so, you know, she's willing to, to not only receive testimony from these witnesses, but then for them to also help her put into place what would be needed going forward to really uh, you know, secure their trust that they're not going to have any reprisals if they do testify. Another interesting response I, I thought was, uh, you know, I asked her, and this question is for you, Christopher, you know, I asked, I, she noted that in, in one of her responses that, that they're going to have a public facing website soon where people can, people can upload data, photographs, all that sort of thing. Uh, videos. Uh, and she also said that she's going to get to the bottom of why this hasn't been done yet. And this is, this is something where, again, I'm very critical of, um, of, uh, of uh, b both Arrow and OUSDINS. It's, if, if I were in charge of a program, uh, so uh, let's say Ronald Moultrie, that their number one mission was to bring in whistleblowers and bring in data. The first thing out of the gate I would do is, is have a website up in no time flat. And I, I, that's really puzzled me as to why it has taken that long for this to happen. Chris, what, are your, uh, what do you know about all of that? I know that, 
that that's something that I, clearly she's wanting to know why it's taken this long for for anything to happen. Also, in, in addition to that, there has been literally zero engagement on the Arrow Twitter website, which just blows my mind. Well, Kirkpatrick said it himself. He's a scientist. He's not a communications expert. Um, and he's having also to deal with multiple amounts of within the DOD and within the intelligence community as well. Look, um, let's give him the benefit of the doubt again. He said that he actually um, put forward a proposal. Um, I think it must have been to the to the DOD um, and IC, um, although I still need to confirm who he actually submitted it to. Um, but he submitted something that said website proposal before Christmas, and it's not got there yet. And I would say certain people would question whether he's pushed that enough in terms of um, from, from understanding he's a two star, he can make some phone calls, push that through if he wanted to. Um, but look, I, I think it was made very, very clear from um, uh, the, the hearing that he's very, very much into the science. Um, but the, I, I would argue that this is great because you want communication, you want transparency, and, and this website will accomplish that. Fantastic. But very, very good sources of mine who I trust, multiple sources now, are coming at me saying that we have special access programs dealing with captured and reverse engineering craft, which appear to be from non-human intelligence. This is not science. This is an investigation, an investigation, you know, boots on the ground, kicking down doors, getting to the bottom of what's happening. And I think that's needed. We need someone uh, like Lou Elizondo or Jay Stratton in there, basically giving zero Fs and basically just going all in and, you know, making a big racket to ensure that the information is getting through to both the public and Congress as well. That, that That's so important. But also I'd ask as well that you know, we have the National um, Geospatial Intelligence Agency, we have the National Reconnaissance Office, um, we have Space Command, um, Space Force, th th they must be collecting data. So, I mean, it's getting into those agents as well. Look, we have um, the former DNI, John Radcliffe, going on Fox News, basically saying these things are being seen by satellites, by the way, which most likely got him into trouble. So, look, um, why are we relying on you know, spy drone footage when we, we think they, they must be capturing these on satellites as well. And um, if sources are correct, it, then they're coming from space. The, 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 this right. data exists. It's just getting access to it. Um, and that's also the same as well with these special access programs. And, and I think patience is running really, really thin here. I, I, I think it really, really has. I mean, bureaucracy is running its course. And this isn't a priority, despite the fact, by the way, that some UAP, because we're talking about unidentified craft, they could be Chinese, they could be Russian in origin. I mean, if these punks aren't taking it seriously, you know, if I'm China, if I'm Russia, I'll just create something that looks like a, a UAP that they usually wouldn't take seriously, you know, surprise attack there, because they, they, they clearly don't care. Um, so you've got yourself, you know, it doesn't matter how much money that you're spending in the defense budget each year in America, if you don't have people on the ball here in terms of being aware of what's going on and making sure that all the gaps are plugged in, that then you're in serious trouble. And despite all the rhetoric coming out from Moultrie, from Lloyd Austin and others, they obviously don't care because the funding still isn't there. It's not being prioritized. Okay. So, I mean, that's one issue as well. So it's, it really, really is frustrating. And I wouldn't be surprised that if, if more stuff starts getting leaked in, in the next few um, months and stuff, starts coming out because I, I think really the frustration's building here and um, I don't think it's good enough anymore. And I, even I'm running out of patience now, you know, so <laughs> I think we need to make some progress. Yeah. I, I think everyone, yeah, just... everyone's really running out of patience and, and sorry, I, I, let me just uh, bring up one note. So, you know, you were talking about crash retrieval programs. We've heard this as well from multiple people in DOD, IC. And then on top of that, Dr. Gary Nolan has, has said, it, uh, said it himself that these do exist. Vinny, what, what, uh, what, what's, your, what's your sort of thinking on all of that and what Chris was just talking about? You were about to say something before I interrupted. 
Yeah, something that I've mentioned previously when I when I was spoken to you, Matt, is that if Dr. Kirkpatrick is not running under Title 50 authorities and he's hearing witness testimony from whistleblowers, how is he able to go and verify that information if he doesn't have access to the relevant agencies, the relevant special access programs, wherever they may lie? You know, even um, recently, Senator Gillibrand was in a Senate Armed Services Committee meeting where she raised the issue of collaboration with General Anthony Cotton of STRATCOM and he did sort of reiterate that Stratcom and the other co-commands were talking with Arrow. But to what degree is Dr. Kirkpatrick get, getting this information, which can then be relayed onto Senator Gillibrand and others? You know, is there sort of bottlenecking and stovepiping and all these things happening that, you know, it's just not running enough to to go anywhere? You know, there are so many frustrations that we've seen and heard about publicly and from various sources so you know this is still early days and with all the frustrations we're not likely to get anything you know just thrown at us these big answers straight away so you know i think it's just a case of uh, just keeping the the pressure applied and and seeing where this goes i i totally agree I come back i come back to that quickly i would yeah, say yeah. why did it take a public hearing for him to request um the authority title 50 authority to actually have that what why has it taken that long to actually request that and also i'd question something else as well in terms of the testimony taken taken by kirkpatrick it was referenced in the recent letter from the senators warner and rubio that they want regular reporting to be kept updated uh what the test what, what the testimony of what the content of the testimony taken from the whistleblowers was so reading behind between the lines here that is telling me that information which is important isn't getting through to the congress on time or isn't being reported at all currently by kirkpatrick otherwise why would they even mention that in a letter i would argue at this point when it actually comes down to whistleblower testimony and actually getting to the bottom of potential saps i, I would say that arrow is potentially redundant because senators have more powers i would argue to actually get to the bottom of this and i think like i said before i think um you could argue that the Arrow and Kirkpatrick potentially being boxed in because all these whistleblowers have already spoken to Congress. They've spoken to Congress, which is why the Intelligence Authorization Act contained the initial, the initial language in there for whistleblowers. They've already spoken to Congress. So what's happening is they're going to Congress, they're having conversations with Congress, giving all their testimony, and then they're going to Kirkpatrick. Sometimes Kirkpatrick may not even be aware that these people have spoken to Congress beforehand. And then what the Congress is doing is they're exchanging notes. Okay, what did the testimony say when they spoke to us? And what is Kirkpatrick telling us? So I, I think I think to an extent you could argue that they're being boxed in. And um, I mean, my dream scenario would be to have a church committee part two where really we lay all this bare in terms of the obfuscation coming from the DOD. And it's just, yeah, sorry, I'm getting very, very frustrated. <laughs> I, I need a cup of tea. <laughs> I totally understand. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would... I, I would completely agree with this. I, it, to me, in my perception, it seems that Ronald Moultrie and, and these folks were purposely hamstringing Arrow, do, laying impediments in their path to make it almost impossible for him to do the job. For, and again, the Title 10, Title 50 thing, and, and I think that that is probably one of the reasons why Senator Gillibrand in her interview encouraged folks to come directly to her. She has more legal authority than Arrow. And, and again, this is all kind of born out of, in my opinion, an attempt by the DOD to make Arrow as least, least efficient as possible and make it impossible uh, for for Dr. Kirkpatrick to do his job. Now, having said that, I've also been very critical of him. I've uh, I, you know I, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. But you know, as you mentioned earlier, he's like an SES two, a two uh, almost like a two star general. If I would think he would be able to pick up the phone and within a one month period have a front facing website. Uh, but if he you know if he's being hamstrung by not having the money to do this. Um, and this goes back to the earlier part. It just blows me away that they did not get the funding that Senator Gillibrand and these other senators uh, spoke about. And I want to kind of jump off a little bit. You, you, uh, you mentioned this. Um, you mentioned this letter uh, that was sent to uh, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Uh, this letter was dated on April 27th, and I believe 
this uh, became public the following day. And uh, the letter is uh, to the Honorable uh, Lloyd J. Austin, Secretary of U.S. Department of Defense, and the Honorable Avril D. Haynes, Director of National Intelligence. And this letter is from uh, uh, Democrat Senator Mark Warner and Republican Senator Marco Rubio, uh, Warner being the chairman of the, uh, uh, what, uh, what is this, uh, intelligence? I'm not sure uh, what department this, or what committee this came out of, but I want to touch on a, f a few of the things here. And again, this, this goes back to the obfuscation that elements of the DOD and the intelligence community have done for literally decades. And we'll, after we cover this, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go back to what, what I asked Senator Gillibrand about, the, the, these gatekeepers that are clearly doing what they can to hide all of this from the American public. Um, and sorry, I'm gonna jump, uh, take another uh, left turn here. One thing to keep in mind is who, is who in the DOD is going to hide balloons or quadcopters or anything like that? I mean, obviously specifics, but to go to the extent of ruining people's careers and uh, engaging in administrative terrorism, they're, the DOD or the IC, they're not going to do this over some kind of prosaic thing. There's obviously something non-prosaic that they are trying to protect. Anyway, I know I jump around a bit, but let's, uh, let's talk about the bullet points in, in this uh, letter. Uh, so one of the things uh, he says in here, uh, the senators say, the FY23 NDAA requires the director of Aero, doctor, who would be Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, to report directly to the principal deputy director of national intelligence, uh, PDDNI, we know they love their acronyms, and the Dep Deputy Secretary of Defense, despite assurances that there is a proposed plan to implement this change in, re in reporting and circulation, we have yet to see any final guidance issue issued. We request that you provide us, provide us an update on the proposed plan, including the timeline for issuance and the final uh, final guidance. Chris, what 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 are they talking about here specifically? Is this about moving Arrow out from under uh, of uh, uh, OUSDINS? Yes, yes, that's, that's that's correct. So basically, they're they're now going to report, or Kirkpatrick is directly going to report to um, the uh, principal. Um, Deputy Director of National Intelligence, so I think Daisy Dixon, and Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. So, you know, that, that was a really, really big deal, getting this thing moved out of um, OUSD and I, INS and Moultrie, basically. I think they're only reporting to him now um, for, for minor um, things, I think it's like HR issues and things like that. Um, but otherwise, they're reporting to um, two very, very superior figures and more superior to more severe superior than Moultrie as well now. So um yeah, so so yeah, they're they're basically asking, and this is the chair and vice chair of the intelligence committee, and they're basically asking what why has this not been implemented yet? And I also I'll add another thing as well is that um at least Lloyd Austin serves within the National Security Council within the White House. And we know that the National Security Council has set up its own UAP um, interagency team now. Uh, so, so one wonders what's going on with that, and whether there is something else happening behind the scenes here in terms of control over the UAP issue um, with the White House versus the Congress in this. Um, so perhaps you have a situation where Moultrie and Haynes, who actually previously seemed much more open to being transparent on this topic, um, maybe you have a situation now where they're reporting directly to to Biden's team on this, and they're trying to make some progress. And in the meantime, that they're basically ignoring the Congress. I, I don't know. There's friction there between the Congress and, and the White House, definitely. For sure. And let's uh, we'll we'll go through a little bit further on this on this letter. Uh, so one of the things, another bullet point here, uh, FY23 and DAA specified that the Director of National Intelligence will, which is Avril Haines, will appoint a Deputy Director of Aero from the intelligence community. However, to date, a Deputy Director has not been identified. This Deputy Director of Aero is intended to be the focal point for IC integration and to be fully empowered by the PDD&I, 
to, conv uh, to convene the IC on the UAP issue. We ask that you update, uh, update us on the timeline. So again, another position was supposed to be filled and the Pentagon is, in my view, purposely dragging their feet, trying to torpedo this whole thing. Uh, now, this gets into some more interesting uh, things here, last few points, which we, we, we touched on a little bit earlier. So the, the third bullet point on this letter to, uh, to Secretary uh, Austin and uh, Director Haynes, the FY23 NDAA established a secure process for Arrow to interview witnesses. We are pleased with the number of interviews Arrow has conducted, but ask Congress be regularly informed about the content of the interviews going forward. I mean, that's significant. That's basically saying that that Arrow has not been telling Congress what these whistleblowers have been telling them. And then, and then you have, then you have um, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick kind of glossing over the whole thing in the Senate hearing that, uh, the recent Senate hearing on, on Arrow. Um, yeah, Vinny, what do you think about that? I mean, that, that's for, for them to have to specify, hey, Arrow, tell us about what these whistleblowers have been telling you. That, I don't know what to think about that, yeah. but it's not good. No, it's not good at all. I mean, you've got two members of the Gang of Eight here, people who have extreme amounts of power to be able to do something with this information. And if they're not getting it, how can they act? You know, so, yeah, it, it, they need to be kept in the loop with what is reported by the whistleblowers to Arrow. You know, there's got to be some streamlined or structured way for this to to be a regular thing so that the information flows, you know. But again, this is just another example of how things are just slowed down and and, uh, and not happening as per the um, NDAA. Like the previous point about the IC uh, integration for the deputy director, that, that again, we're now in May and we still have many parts of the legislation that have not been implemented, and it's just not acceptable. It's absolutely not acceptable, and it and it completely flies in the face of congressional intent. And it, in a way, it's it's sort of giving the middle finger to Senator Gillibrand and the other senators uh, that they don't care what what they're legislating, which that's that's not how a democracy works, uh, for sure. Uh, another point here, the FY23 NDAA also directed Arrow to stand up a secure public-facing website or communication mechanism to outline the secure process for witnesses to come forward with relevant information. To date, we have seen no efforts to, commun to communicate the existence of the secure process to the public. We request that you provide an update on the plan to publicize the secure process for witnesses to come forward. So these whistleblowers that have come forward, they essentially have gone to members of Congress, and then and then these members of Congress have then, you know, sent them over to Arrow. You need to call this person, and we understand that some of these interviews have taken place in person in a in a, a secure facility. Others have been done over the telephone under a secure uh, phone means. But um, uh, yeah, I just, it, it, again, I just, a, 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 essentially a two-star general that cannot find a way to, to make all of this happen, I just don't understand it. And here's the other thing too, if, if I were Dr. Kirkpatrick and all of this were mandated, and, and maybe he has done this, but if, if I were being stopped at every turn, I would immediately go to Congress and say, look, these guys aren't letting me do my job. Um, so, and, and it, it, I just don't understand it. Uh, and then finally they say, uh, we have not seen an Arrow strategic communication strategy. Arrow established a Twitter presence in July of 2022, but has yet to post anything further, despite attracting over 31,000 followers. This highlights the lack of communication and transparency with the public. We seek to understand why Arrow has not made use of its social media presence and the future plan for educating the public on the mission and findings of Arrow. Again, same thing. That, that Twitter page has been up for how long? And absolutely no post whatsoever. I, to me, that's just unex, unexcusable. And, and the other thing I would, I would say as well, if I were standing up in office and I were the director of that office, Dr. Kirkpatrick, the, I would say the number two person 
the number, the, the, actually probably the first hire I would make would be a communications director because your office is only going to be as successful as you're able to communicate your mission. And yeah, so, so I, you know, I'm very frustrated by that. Chris, am I, am I being <laughs> overly frustrated by that? No, not at all. I think that Patrick would disagree with you because he's very much into the science. He's like, let me just do my job. He wants to get into a room, analyze the cases, basically. Although I don't know how he effectively does that without a deputy director from um, the intelligence community. Because remember, with the intelligence community, then you've got access to the, um, the, National, uh, the National Security Agency, the NRO, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So how are you going to work out all these cases just with a video, basically, using MCWEST techniques, unless you can actually have the full data? For instance, let's look at the West Coast events that happened recently. It's still not knowing where these things came from. So I spoke to Susan Goff a few months ago, and she told me that they're reinvestigating um, those cases as part of that. Um, so that, that that's really big. And I think with some of these cases, you can't positively identify them unless you know who they came, where they came from and who the operators are. Those, those are basic things. And with, yeah, I, I, and what you just said in terms of communications, um, director, yeah, that, that, that is, that is so important. I think that, you know, it would be great to have a communication strategy in terms of this in actually um, providing monthly updates, how the progress has gone. Um, and, and if there are any holdups or anything like that, just, just communicate them. I think if we're honest, you know, um, then people would understand that. And if Kirkpatrick had said before, for instance, that I need the proper authorities to actually do my mission, instead of having to wait until a public hearing to do that, then we would have understood that, you know? So, um, Communication is is very very much key to this, and um, I'm very disappointed so far about how it's gone. I, I would agree, and again, this this comes back to my frustration with Dr. Kirkpatrick. Maybe he's not the man for the job. Um, the the director of an office with on a on a, on a topic that this is important. If you don't have a front facing uh, public uh, web page, you're not responding on Twitter. Uh, you have no communication strategy. You're not, you're not communicating to Congress what these whistleblowers have been saying. And then you go in front of a hearing and, in my opinion, blow off what these whistleblowers have been telling me. I, I don't know. I mean, again, I, I, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, but everything that I'm hearing so far says to me he is not the man for the job. Uh, he may be a great scientist and all of that, but you usually don't have scientists running this kind of program, you would have somebody from the intelligence community that's, that's going to be uh, open to it uh, and not, uh, it's just, it makes, makes no sense. So let's uh, jump back into the, into the interview. One of the last questions that I asked was, uh, wh what would she say to the gatekeepers that have kept this uh, secret? And, and she noted that, you know, we obviously cannot have Chinese balloons but said that it's, it's not the job of the gatekeepers to whether to, to level with the public. This, I think, is another really important statement that if you read between the lines, she is not, in my opinion, is not talking about prosaic explanations. It just, it makes no sense. To me, uh, she's talking about orbs, things that are not from here. Otherwise, why would these gatekeepers go to such lengths to hide this and retaliate against whistleblowers and all of that? Uh, Chris, what do you think? Am I reading between the lines here too much, or is, do you think that may have been what she, where she was going with that? No, you're not at all. You, you have to read between the lines with uh, politicians. Anyone who's a political out there who watches all the political shows and who's involved in politics, they, they realize that you have to read between the lines when these kind of statements are made, especially with someone who could literally be put in jail if they say too much because they're being um, they're being given classified materials to work with. So I would say you're right on the money there. And I think, you, I, I think she realizes, and it's being made very, very clear to me, that Gillibrand knows and other members of the Congress privy to the data realize isn't from here, it's from somewhere else. They know that, 
they know that already. Um, I mean, and all those people that doubt them, that they say, oh, you know, this is just Lou Elizondo and this is just Chris Mellon. They have no idea what they're talking about. They do not. They have no idea. <laughs> right. I, 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 I wonder if they're missing, I, I don't even think they've got a brain cell between them, to be fair, because yeah. you've got um, John Radcliffe. I know for a fact that none of them know John Radcliffe. I, don't, I, I doubt Lou Elizondo or Chris Mellon have ever met John Radcliffe in their life, but they're both singing from the same hymn sheet. So are others who have actually been privy to this data as well. They're all singing from the same hymn sheet. I mean, unless um, Lou Elizondo has, you know, telepathic powers and can, like, force you to do things, um, <laughs> even though he doesn't know you, and I don't know. Right. It seems uh, it seems very, very unlikely that, you know, it's a one-man mission to um, deceive everyone. Right. I mean, uh, we're talking about seri serious, you know, serious, a serious topic here and a serious politician in terms of, um, Senator Gillibrand. Um, uh, and I think, again, people just need to get real about this whole thing, you know, instead of just being childish, really, and being egocentric. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think progress is being made. She knows what she's talking about, and you're perfectly right to read between the lines. So, so Vinny, our, our final question to her was on legal amnesty. We asked, uh, should there be legal amnesty for folks that have hidden this from the public? And I don't think she really, uh, she may not have understood exactly what I meant by that. And of course, what I meant by that were the people that have, have for decades hidden this from the American public, destroyed careers, destroyed lives over this. And, and may these, these uh, NGOs uh, or non-elected officials that have decided on behest of all of us that, oh, you guys don't need to know about this stuff. Uh, and again, this goes back decades before uh, quadcopters or, or anything like that. So, Vinny, do you think she misunderstood the question, or do you think she was just being careful in how, how she answered that? Um, it, it's hard to say, and I wouldn't like to speculate too much. But I think she didn't look at it 100% how it should have been answered. You know, we need to... And this is a conversation that has been happening for a couple of years now, that these people that have been withholding this information from us, how much do we focus on letting them off? Like, give us the information and we'll kind of let you off to a degree. And then how much do we focus on punishing? I suppose it's the only really word, you know, this is kind of maybe could be defined in some ways as criminal for what they've done in the past. So which part of that do we focus on? Do we focus on just getting the information and forgetting about all, all of what they've been withholding or do we really, you know, put it to them? So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think she really focused on that. I think she was still sort of down that whistleblower sort of uh, line of questioning. So, you know, again, I don't want to speculate. Of too course. Much. Of course. Chris, what do you think? Um, <clears throat> sorry, what... what, what? So, um, so you know, when we were asking her about whether there should be amnesty extended to the folks that have been engaged in covering this up for decades, because as, as Vinny noted, they're most likely, and I, I am 100% in agreement, there was likely criminal activity that took place. What do you think? Is, uh, do you think it was kind of a misunderstanding of the question? And or actually, scrap that. Do you think that there should be amnesty for these whistleblowers? and as a mechanism to encourage these folks to come forward and spill the beans? There shouldn't be just amnesty for whistleblowers. There, 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 there should be amnesty for aerospace companies. That, that's where this needs to go. I mean, if you, want to, if you want to get to these programs, if you want access to them, especially if they've been siphoned off to aerospace companies and Congress has no way of getting to them, um, or at least it would take years or decades to even get through right. those processes. You need amnesty from them. And I, I don't, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I, I think that I think I I, I would just um, I'll, I'll come back in um, two years maybe, and I'll be able to talk in further detail about this. But um, <laughs> I, I think yeah, keep keep asking that question in terms of. Um, aerospace companies and um, keep on thinking about how we got to this right. stage we're in at the moment. I, I, I totally agree. Okay, let's get to some listener questions. Everyone has been super patient with their, uh, with their questions. Uh, let's see here. So a question from Nick M. 
a question from the chat. Who has been retaliated against and how will the retaliators be punished? So I can, what I can share is that I have spoken with, um, with whistleblowers that have experienced a significant amount of retaliation from different elements. Um, I, it's not something I can comment on, but it, is, it has happened. The retaliation is significant, and it has occurred even in spite of this legislation. And this is something that we are going to be uh, communicating directly with Senator Gillibrand's office about these cases that we are aware of. Um, so, uh, Chris or Vinny, and it, also for, for any questions here in the chat, if you have anything, any, any questions specifically for Vinny or Chris, just say so. Uh, Vinny and Chris, any, any thoughts on that or anything that you would like to share in terms of uh, uh, what kind of retaliation has taken place that you can speak about? I mean, it's happened on all levels, hasn't it? It's happened within the armed services when it comes to pilots and service personnel, even reporting this kind of thing there's been pushed back you know and this goes right up to the highest level so other than adding that to what you already said you know it, it's been happening for a long time and on all levels chris i i would say that you have to get you have to get uh, as much as some really really horrible stuff has happened and you're dealing with trained killers a lot of the time who are making these threats i i would say that once the truth comes out you need you need to get beyond that because we may be dealing with some more concerning things in terms of the activities from some UAP, which seem to be prepping the battlefield. So I, I think that the concern needs to be placed elsewhere, which is perhaps why some of these people don't want the information out. Perhaps, perhaps these people are just good patriots, you know, American patriots. Sorry, my son's coming. In. But um, I, would, I would question that. Sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, I, I, uh, I completely agree. And what I will say about that retaliation, I would classify it as administrative terrorism. That is the best way to describe what these, uh, these uh, men and women in uniform have experienced. It's just, it's just crazy. Okay, super, super chat question here. I keep hearing uh, there are military and intelligence people that will be coming forward in 2023 with huge revelations. What are your sources saying? Vinny, I'll throw that, throw that to you first. Well, you know, we did. We've been hearing about this for some time from multiple uh, people publicly and from sources as well. And, you know, I think these people have come forward, but they are coming forward in classified settings. So we will not be hearing that information anytime soon. But, you know, from what I've heard, and I know from, you know, having conversations with other people, that they've also been told that this information is getting brought forward. But again... It's not something that's likely to become public. Agreed. Soon. Uh, Chris, uh, I know you're you're uh, having uh, having to uh, deal with uh, your son popping into the into the uh, Christopher Sharp studio there. Uh, so the the question was, if you didn't hear it, was uh, this was a super chat question. I I keep hearing that there are military and intelligence people that are will be coming forward in 2023 with huge revelations. What are your sources saying? Uh, my sources have to be very, very careful with me because I'm a journalist. Uh, but I would say, in answer to the the battlefield question, these things have been here for a long time. What are you talking about? We're dealing with the entire university. When people say, oh, UFOs are just one entity, it's like, the universe is a pretty big place, you know, like, they're not just coming from one civilization. I mean, it's just a little bit simplistic here. I mean, Earth's complicated enough, and we're just one planet. I mean, it seems right. a little bit simplistic. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I would say... Um, I, I, all I'm hearing is chatter from multiple, multiple sources on this that there could be some big revelations. I don't know exactly what they would be, um, but I'm expecting some big things. I, I, I can't comment whether they are going to be game changing things, but I'm hearing they're big. But let's just wait until they come out to see how much of a game changer they actually are. But all I can say is that we're not just dealing with, um, you know, two star, three star here within the um, within the Pentagon we're dealing with like some really, really big players that we've had um, directors of the C former directors of the CIA comment on UAP before. Look, a lot of senior people know about this. So I would hope that someone very, very senior does come forward to actually kind of um, make more of a, a wave in terms of UAP because of their name and their status. So yeah, that, that's, that would be my hope anyway, but no one, no one, no one ain't telling me anything. So uh, yeah. I, what I can share is what have been what has been shared with me. The extent of what I can say is that 
some very significant things will be coming uh, forward. Uh, very, 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 very significant. Uh, and I think hopefully by the end of the summer, we will be having a very different uh, conversation. Uh, okay, moving, uh, moving on here. Uh, so uh, I'll throw this to Vinny. What if bad actors, uh, what if bad actors are in Arrow, how can whistleblowers trust them? It's a very good question. It's a very good question indeed. I don't know. I mean, we hear that these people may be interviewed by Dr. Kirkpatrick. Um, I don't know if there's any other people within Arrow that they're talking to. I really don't know. Um, I mean, even if Dr. Kirkpatrick is a bad actor, he's still got a job to do and he's still got to report to the relevant people. And if, you know, if he's not doing his job, there'll be repercussions. So I think there's only so much you can obfuscate and hide when you're in such a, such a job. So, you know, I like to think that no matter what happens, no matter what stonewalling's going on, that things will still, you know, slip through the net and, you know, even uh, the delays and and the slow movement of this, this office getting up and running in the first year. I, I like to think that eventually something will happen. And if it doesn't, then Congress and the powers that be will have to kind of reassess the whole thing. Where do they go from here? Do they scrap Arrow completely? Does an office need to be set up in the executive branch that reports much higher up to almost to the White House? You know, there are there are many ways that this can sort of change in the next six to 12 months. And I think, you know, maybe we'll see that happen. I, I certainly hope so. Another question specifically for you, Vinny. Uh, do you feel good about her attitude and stance and her being Senator Gillibrand in, in that interview? She, yes, she's given me absolutely no reason to to think particularly negative of her. I know she was very cautious in the way that she answered questions. That's to be expected. There's no surprise there for me whatsoever. And again, let's just see how this plays out. You know, we saw in the hearing that I felt there should have been some follow-up questions from the Senator to Dr. Kirkpatrick. But again, we don't always get what we want and think, you know, as, as someone watching from our cozy front rooms at home that maybe we would have done this, we would have done that. So, you know, I give her the benefit of the doubt on some things and you know, let's see how this plays out. I, I know people get very impatient and they want the answers yesterday, but, you know, as someone who follows this on a daily basis, you know, um, I see where this is going and I think we can remain uh, somewhat positive. I, I agree. So, uh, Chris, uh, Chris, do you think we will see Eric Davis, Admiral Wilson or Bob Lazar testify in public? I know there have been rumors of possible uh, uh, house hearings uh, this June. You think uh, we might see folks like them or even like Blue Elizondo or, or other, uh, other folks that have been in, involved in this topic? Oops. <laughs> I'll throw that to Vinny. I think your, your mic's off there, Chris. Um, oh. Personally, I don't think we're going to see any of those faces. I think there are so many more people uh, within the uh, intelligence community people within uh, higher positions in the government as well that are probably more likely to be called first. I think, you know, further down the line, we may start seeing the likes of people who worked in previous programs. But this summer, if we were to see Lou or Eric Davis and that, I'd be very surprised. But that's just my opinion. Chris, are you, uh, are you I, back I can up? answer now. Sorry. Oh, there we my, go. my little boy was like, throwing his words oh, good. Uh, apologies for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would say that notes being taken, I, I, I would, I, I wouldn't suggest that a date has been put in place at the moment. I say it's very much a, a process. It's still ongoing in terms of getting it all prepared in terms of the hearing. Again, I will use the language that is the intent for, um, for Burchett to actually hold hearings uh, within the oversight committee and one of those subcommittees perhaps i would say that they were probably watching closely what happened in the recent senate hearing as well and learning lessons and taking on board the feedback from the community especially um but i i think that we're in uh we're in very very safe hands and i think that once this is all done and over i think we've learned the full extent in terms of what's gone on behind the scenes and getting the hearing, if it happens, um, in motion, um, I, I think I think it's going to be really, really big. Actually, I would note as well that Representative Luna is in uh, that um, that committee, and um, she's former U.S. Air Force, and she's not exactly the biggest fan of the U.S. Air Force either. Um, so um, I expect some fireworks to potentially take place. 
I, I, I agree. I am very much looking forward to it. And yeah, I think, I think by the summer we are going to, uh, or by the end of the summer, I would say we'll be having a different conversation. And I also want to bring up too, one, one, criti uh, one criticism I've heard Mick West bring up is that these senators, staffers uh, have, have uh, just kind of uh, bullshitted their way with, uh, with their senators and their congressmen and, and these sort of, uh, I guess, I don't know if they consider them UFO enthusiast staffers have completely fooled the senators or, or Congress uh, people into putting forth all this legislation. They just, he's, they just completely fell for some charade. I've, there is no more asinine argument. I mean, Mick West <laughs> makes tons of them. Uh, we know that. But there's no more asinine argument than that. I can tell you from extensive conversations that I've had with multiple um, multiple staffers that work for these congressmen and senators. And you have to keep in mind, these, these aren't staffers that are just bringing coffee or something like that. These are, these are staffers that hold very high security uh, clearances, staffers that, that um, specialize in the intelligence community, uh, community or the DOD community. These staffers are, they, number one, they're working their asses off for the people in this country and, and really the world when it comes to this topic. They are very well informed on this topic. And they have to be because they are the ones that are going to these senators and saying, you need, you need to legislate on this particular issue. This is the evidence. And I guarantee you, it's not just balloons and drones that they are concerned about. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, has Mick West or any of the other, these other people who are criticizing, have any of them, from your understanding, ever worked in politics before? So Mick West, uh, my understanding, Mick West uh, and, um, oh, this Jason guy, I'm Colavito, I don't know what he is, or the, the guy in the basement, um, uh, what's his name, Green Street. I don't believe they've ever worked in politics, national security, um, or anything like that. I, my personal belief is that these folks are, are really just there to uh, sow uh, distrust and chaos um, they're not, they're not bringing anything constructive to the conversation. Their sole, their sole thing is to disrupt the conversation. Um, you know, and the other thing you have to ask yourself too, like why, if let's say I were interested in, uh, let's say I were interested in, or not interested in snowboarding or something like that, I wouldn't, I would just move on to something else. I wouldn't spend all of my time on it. Or let's say uh, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. I would say, okay, I don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster, and then I'd go out and have a beer. I wouldn't spend eight, nine, ten hours a day running some debunking website uh, with the sole purpose. It, it just makes absolutely no sense. So, that's again, that's my personal opinion. Uh, a lot of people may disagree with that. But yeah, to a uh, very long-winded way, I don't believe any of these folks, A, have ever interviewed a sitting United States senator, for one, uh, or a congressman. Uh, B, I don't believe any of them have ever had conversations with uh, officials on Capitol Hill. Um, I think they're just, they're just kind of armchair keyboard warriors um, doing whatever they're doing for a reason I do not understand at all. Absolutely. Based on that, they provide zero insight to the conversation, um, zero value. And to be fair, they're just not worth my time. Um, you've got to be listening to people who actually do have insight, who know the sources involved, who know people within the DOD, intelligence, and politicians as well, who have actually seen the classified data. So multiple sources, um, if they're unconnected, even better because they're not having conversations perhaps and they're all coming at it from one way and they're stating clearly what we're seeing is non-human intelligence. So I'd rather listen to those people and people like Marek, for example, who does actually have political experience working in the Obama White House and a games developer or someone who clearly has psychological um, like many of them do. So I wouldn't really give them any worry whatsoever or listen or take them seriously. Right. They're but, irrelevant to the conversation. Well, exactly. And, and look, if I, I mean, let's say that I don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. 
hey, if somebody wants to bring up and show some evidence uh, about the Loch Ness Monster being real, I'd say, okay, convince me otherwise. But with these folks, it's a predetermined con conclusion and their sole purpose in, the, in life is either clicks or maybe meeting uh, performance metrics for Rupert Murdoch to keep yourself gainfully employed at, at News Corp or, um, I mean, who knows? I mean, I have no idea what makes, what makes these people uh, tick. It's, it's true, truly a mystery, but they're not doing the country any favors at all. Uh, and they do not, they do not speak to multiple people in DOD, IC, or elsewhere. Uh, I, I would be surprised if, if they were. Okay, final question here. Uh, has Gillibrand ever addressed lack of U.S. Air Force involvement? That is actually a question I wish I would have asked. Uh, it, it, because it is a question that I've had for, for quite some time. I, I sus, I don't know how she would address it, but I think it's been very clear, uh, from folks like, uh, Christopher Mellon, who was uh, what a former assistant under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, that the Air Force has not been cooperating at all. Um, again, this is a democracy. These folks work for us. It's not the other way around. And it's not for them to decide if they want to play by the rules or if they want to follow the law. That's not what this country was built on. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, I, my guess is that the Air Force has a lot to hide and has a lot of legal exposure for what they've done over the past 80 years. Um, and the other, the other issue as well, which I've spoken about uh, quite a bit, you know, there have been many people uh, that were former U.S. Air Force nuclear launch control officers, above ground police, uh, uh, nu uh, police officers at Minuteman uh, nuclear missile squadrons that had UAP experiences, either above ground where they encountered these craft uh, above, above missile silos, or having, if they were a launch control officer, having UAP disable their, their Minuteman uh, flight of missiles, which a uh, flight is, is 10 ICBMs. These, these cases are documented. Uh, these people have, have testified, multiple people have testified to Arrow under oath that these things occurred. Under oath, under the pen, penalty of perjury, um, these folks have, have testified. And um, I am quite sure that is one of the main reasons that the Air Force is looking the other way and trying to obfuscate and lie about it. Um, yeah, and, and and kind of one one thing we'll we'll sort of close on before uh, before we end here. These whistleblowers, they have nothing to gain and everything to lose by coming forward with their stories. These are men and women patriots that have served our country and and put their lives on the line for us and. We owe it to them to listen to them and respect their testimony. And Arrow owes it to Congress to tell their uh, report these whistleblower uh, stories up the chain, uh, up, up to Congress, to ignore them and, and sort of blow them off, which is how I took Senator Kirkpatrick's response, I think um, really flies in the face of the congressional uh, intent. Uh, Chris, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I'm very, very com confident that he has blown them off. I'm very confident in some cases that he hasn't taken them. And I say, I don't just say that. Um, I, I, I sincerely believe that in some instances, he's perhaps pretended to take them seriously, um, but then behind their backs kind of blown them off, basically, and said, actually, I don't think they were at all believable at all. So um, I, I don't, you know, I think there are at least some cases when that has happened. But all I would say is that in cases like this, it takes a investigator sometimes, not a scientist, to actually um, verify and validate what they're saying speak to the relevant um, offices and agencies before doing, um, before kind of like making conclusions. Um, and all I can say is that um, I, I think that, I, I think that it's very, very telling from the recent Warner and uh, Ruby Aletta that um, they feel that certain details aren't being to them. And like I said, these whistleblowers have all come to the Congress before they've gone to Kirkpatrick. So they're basically, um, they, they've got the notes, they know what they've said, so they're exchanging 
disputes between what they've taken down from the testimony and what Kirkpatrick's told them. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think to a certain extent, it, I, I think um, the DOD in general and Arrow are being boxed in. Um, I don't want to be too unfair to, um, to Sean Kirkpatrick. He's a scientist. I think he needs more support there. I think you do need those investigators in there at the same time. I think you need that person from the intelligence community um, assisting him as well to make sure that he gets that data that he needs. And, and he needs the authorization as well to get this data from National Constance Office, um, NGA, and other places that will have the data to actually help assist him um, get to the bottom of live case, but also get him to the bottom of potential illegal saps as well. Yeah, and that's where this whole Title 50 thing comes in. If if Kirkpatrick is being told about a, a unacknowledged special access program that has uh, retrieved off-world vehicle, retrieved, sorry, retrieved intact off-world vehicles, let's say, theoretically, um, and he does not have Title 50 to go digging into those saps, he, he's hamstrung. However, Senator Gillibrand and these senators, they do have that authority to look into those saps. And everything that I'm hearing is that there are quite a few people with that data that uh, have either come forward or, or are coming forward. And, and, and also, speaking about coming forward, I would say what, what has been shared with me by several whistleblowers is a almost a, a deflation, a, a frustration, um, and almost, uh, I would say, an anger in a way as to how their testimony has been taken and treated. Um, and I, I think that was a perception and how Dr. Kirkpatrick seemed to, to, to gloss over uh, what they have really gone out of their way and, and, and put their butts on the line uh, to do that. Uh, my hope is with this news that Senator Gillibrand wants these folks to come directly to her office. Uh, I'm hoping that that changes their attitude. We, um, we, we were told of specific reporting mechanisms to relay to these whistleblowers uh, by uh, Senator Gillibrand's office, and we are going to facilitate that communication and encourage these folks that we, we speak with um, to, to come forward to Senator Gillibrand's office. I would say, somebody, somebody said this in the, ch in the chat earlier, and I think maybe the, the, um, maybe the, 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 the chat or that particular message uh, was uh, erased. Somebody postulated maybe Senator Gillibrand is part of the cover-up. I can tell you 100% absolutely not. In my conversations uh, with, with that office, I can, I can, you can take this to the bank. She and others will go down in American history books and they will be spoken about for decades to come. And what they are doing for this country and what the sacrifices I think that, or the risks I would say that they've taken politically to bring this topic out of the shadows, we owe Senator Gillibrand, Senator Rubio, and others that are supporting this effort a huge debt of gratitude. They are not part of the cover-up. They are working to uncover it. Uh, and this is sort of like um, a, a big ball of yarn that's been wound over 80 years, and it's going to take some effort to, to, um, to yank it out. Um, Vinny, any, any sort of, uh, actually, what do you have coming up? I hear, I hear you have a couple of really great guests uh, coming up on your show. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know who they are. I hope they're okay. Um, yeah. What, what do you have coming up? Yeah. So I am going to be joined by yourself and, uh, our, wow. our other friend here, Chris, Chris Sharp this Wednesday, uh, live on my channel, but also more importantly is the return of my amazing co-host Katie Howland. So Excellent. between the four of us, we're going to have such a wonderful conversation uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. I am as well. I have to say, I, I, as I've uh, as I've said before, uh, Vinny, you you were you were the first person on the UAP topic I ever interviewed, and um, in terms of nervousness, this interview with Senator Gillibrand, that was my amp of nervousness was up at about eleven. <laughs> Uh, but when when uh, when I interviewed you, I, I was about an eight or a nine. I was up there. You're you know, you're, uh, you're you're a legend in this in this community, and it was such an honor uh, for you to give uh, give me your time. Uh, so we're always happy happy to uh, happy to help. 
Uh, Chris, how about yourself? Other than uh, this this party that we have coming up on Wednesday, uh, anything that you can speak about? I know oftentimes there's until it's out in the open, uh, it's uh, mum's a word. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's some really cool stuff happening. It's set to be a very, very boring summer. I'll just go on holiday, turn up your phone for the next six months. Uh, nothing going on here. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, stay tuned. Um, I think we're going to have a really, really good summer. And um, I'd also look towards the next Intelligence Authorization Act and National Defense Authorization Act language being published. I expect some more UAP language to be in there. And uh, yeah, I'm expecting really, really big things. And Vinny, really looking forward to your show. Um, just saw you, you've got some great guests. And uh, yeah, really, really excited for that one. Yeah, I, I, Thanks, I'm very much looking forward to it. And uh, we're just going to yeah, we're gonna wrap it up here. But anyway, thank you both for the generosity of your time and your your uh, very thoughtful input and analysis on this really, really great topic. We are very excited to have this interview. We are hoping to announce some equally exciting interviews uh, to come uh, on The Good Trouble Show. So anyway, I'm Matt. Uh, thanks for joining us. And Chris Sharp and Vinny Adams. Thank you both from uh, across the pond, and we will chat with you soon.